Why don't you turn with me to the book of Matthew? So he had said persecution is coming. Interesting. That's kind of what I'm talking about. Chapter number seven. Verse number 24 says this. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. All right. That, that's the secret. There's a lot of people here. A lot of people read what we're supposed to do. A lot of people hear what we're supposed to do. But where the failure comes in is doing it. Okay? So Jesus didn't talk about hearing what I'm saying. He didn't talk about believing what I'm saying. He didn't talk about any of that. He says, hear it, but do it. And if you do it, then I liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and the heat beat, uh, the, 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 the rain beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, okay, he didn't say, uh, hearing, because we, we, we hear a lot about hearing the word and, and this type of thing. But Jesus is talking about not only hearing what I'm saying, but doing it. Yes. Okay? But doeth it not shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, okay, the same type of rain, same intensity, the floods came, the winds blew, beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. You know, much of Jesus' parables, teachings, ministry, and that type of thing were based on true events. And this particular teaching is one that is based upon a true event, an event that was common knowledge to the education system at that time, and an event that was uh, so critical to uh, a person's state of mind and even a, a political uh, state that it was taught in the uh, Roman education system. Now, the actual event took place in the year 525 BC. I'm going to draw you a picture. Is that all right? All right, this is the Mediterranean Sea. All right, so this is the Nile River. This is the ancient Suez Canal. The one that's there now is not the first, that's the fourth. So the ancient Suez Canal that connected the Red Sea. Now, Cairo is right here now. Cairo didn't exist at that time. Okay? There was a city there that was called the city of An. It's present-day Helopolis. And those of you who went on the tour with us last, uh, last January, uh, you'll probably remember that we went right through Helopolis and uh, on the way to Cairo. And the royal city of Memphis was located right there. And then the royal city of Thebes, which is present-day Luxor, was located right there. Now, at this time, the Persian Empire was the greatest empire on earth, and they were threatened, their power was threatened by Egypt. Well, the emperor of Persia wanted to not only maintain 
the position of the most powerful man in the world with the most powerful kingdom, but he wanted to make sure that the second didn't rise in power to threaten him. And so he decided that he was going to have a, um, he was going to attack first before they had an, an opportunity to attack him. Ah. Please. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate that. And so Cambasis in five... 525 B.C. invaded through Israel, from Persia, through Israel, and through the Sinai Desert, and invaded Egypt, the kingdom of Egypt. Now, at this time, Pharaoh had his, uh, had his palace down in Thebes. And the Pharaoh at that time was called Pesachic, the fourth. He was 22 years old. Uh, but, what? But, the, uh, but as he was 22 years old, but the feeling and the teachings of the priesthood at that time was that Pharaoh was the living God. And that he was God on earth. And so news came to Pharaoh down here, that Cambasis was on his way and that he was going to lay siege to the country and he was going to conquer the country. And Pharaoh said he wouldn't dare. I'm the living God. He, he would not dare do that. He may try, but long before he's successful, he'll turn tail and run. He just won't do it. Well, at this time, Thebes had two royal palaces. There was a royal palace to the north, up here, and a new one to the south. Now, the one to the north had been there for a thousand years, and it had withstood anything and everything. It had withstood attacks, it had withstood a uh, invasions by other armies and so on and so forth. They had been attacked from the south, from Nubia, had been attacked from the Libyans, from the west, had been attacked by the Hittites, by the Babylonians, by the Assyrians, and they were successful. They successfully withstood it. And this palace was built, uh, had its foundation on the, the bedrock that over um, uh, the, the, um, that outcropped over the Nile River. And this was absolutely rock hard, solid um, uh, uh, granite and, uh, and limestone. And the foundation was secure and it had withstood over a thousand years of this type of bombardment. But the new Pharaoh, the 22 year old, he says, I don't want to live in that old building. I, I don't want to live in that old palace. I, I, want to, I want to build a new one. Well, now, Egypt is baked by the sun pretty thoroughly, like 365 days a year. Paula and I were there um, a few years ago when it rained for the first time in 300 years. People thought the world was coming to an end. Uh, they didn't, even, didn't know what it was. And so the, the ground is, is so hard that you can actually build buildings on the sand. And it's, it's, and it's as hard as rock, like sandstone. And, and, and they would do that. And uh, there's... They even do it today. They, and uh, you folks may remember the big high rises that were there in Cairo. Well, that's built on top of the sand. They had no foundation to that. And so the, uh, this particular palace, the new palace, the beautiful, gorgeous, multi-million dollar palace that was being built 
um, was built on the sand. But because there was no threat of rain or any of that type of thing, then there should be no reason for it not to last for hundreds and not another thousand years. So the, the Pharaoh had just moved into his new palace and uh, he received word that Cambasis was on his way. And of course, he, he, he says, no, I'm not afraid of that. I'm the living God. They, 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 he wouldn't dare. Well, they kept getting reports that Cambasis are getting closer and closer and closer. And they says, at, at least, at least uh, go to the, the, the old palace. And we know... Uh, it's been proven to withstand any attacks. We know that you'll be secure there. And uh, we don't know about this new palace. It's, not, it's never been under attack before. We don't know if it's, uh, it, it could withstand or not. He said, no, no. Um, I am the living God. I, uh, what I decree is what will happen. And I, I'll stay in, in my new palace. Well, he kept getting reports that Cambasis is getting closer and closer. First of all, he conquered the city of On. Then he turned south, went down about 15 miles, conquered the city of Memphis. And the reports kept coming back to Pharaoh. And he says, I'm, I'm not afraid. I'm, I'm, I'm secure. And uh, you'll see. You'll see. He'll turn. Well, just like he predicted, Cambasis came up with his own idea of how to conquer. And this was an idea that Pharaoh wasn't counting on. So Cambasis turned his attention at Memphis and he went directly west. Had an army of 52,000. And they marched directly west into the desert. It just didn't make any sense. But Pharaoh says, he's running from me. He's afraid of me. He knows that he's defeated, and so he's running from me. And it looked that way. So Pharaoh was content to stay where he was, not put together any other type of, of uh, uh, precautions for his life to, to be sustained, and pretty much forgot about Cambasis. The reports kept coming in. Well, he's still marching west. He's, uh, and there's nothing to the west except thousands of miles of sand and desert. I mean, the next time you see life is in the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, you go through Libya, you go through Algeria, you go through Morocco, you just keep on going. And uh, there's, there's nothing there but, but, but desert. But he went approximately 152 miles with his army. And then he turned south. And when he turned south, the report came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, I'm not concerned about it. I'm the living God. And he will kill his own army marching through the desert. And he will come to failure. Well, he kept marching south and continued to march south until he got 58 miles south of the city of Thebes and of the palaces. And then at that point, he turned back to the east and he camped on the shores of the Nile River. But not only did he camp on the shores of the Nile River, but he dammed up the Nile River. And the Nile River, you know, flows this direction. And so he dammed up the Nile. And Pharaoh kept getting reports, said the Nile is losing 
its level of, uh, uh, of water. He says, well, that happens every year. No, 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 this is different, Pharaoh. I mean, this, this is caused by, by something else. And they didn't realize that Cambasis was down here. They thought that he was still running south. They didn't realize that he had dammed up the river. And then something happened that had never, ever, ever happened before in the history of Egypt. It began to rain. And not only did it begin to rain, it began to downpour. And it went 24 hours a day for seven days. And that rock hard foundation of Stan began to melt. And as it began to melt, Cambasis had his spies watching, seeing what was happening and what was taking place. And at the maximum time that the rain was doing the most damage, he broke the dam of the Nile. And there was a wall of water, 38 feet tall, came running down the Nile Riverbed. And when it hit the new palace, it absolutely destroyed it. Pharaoh was in there. Now some of his advisors, they took their own advice and ran up to the old palace, the one that was constructed on the rock. Yeah. But when that wall of water hit the new palace, along with the torrential downpour that they were involved with at that time, that palace, that multi-million dollar um, perfect example of, of, um, uh, of wealth and power, totally collapsed. And as Jesus says, great was the fall thereof. Yeah. Yeah. Pharaoh died his entire household. But the same wall of water that, it would, that was also withstood the same type of torrential downpours hit the old palace. And when that wall of water hit the old palace, the palace continued to stay. It did not budge, and those inside were saved. I've walked through that palace myself on at least six different occasions. It's still solid. It's in ruins now because they're not using it anymore. It's, it's just, a, just the columns and the walls and so forth. But it's still there. And it's still founded on the rock. And it's still as sturdy as it was in 525 B.C., over 2,000 years ago, and it's still just as stable. Jesus never mixed words. He was telling his disciples, and this was who he was teaching at this time. He was teaching them before they, he sent them out to minister with him and on his behalf. He says, there will be rain. It will come down hard. And it may hit with such force that you've never even seen it before. This hard and this bad. You know, we're living in a new world right now. We've never experienced this before. I was talking to Ron today. He says, you know, before we could rely upon the experience of our fathers and our grandfathers, the pastors of old, the evangelist, but we've never been through this. We are the first. This is it. And so be prepared. There will be rain. And there will be the damming up 
of that that seems so secure. And there will be the breaking of that dam, which will be overwhelming, which will be destructive power to the point that we never even imagined it was possible. But Jesus is still in control. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. And when we are doing the things that he tells us that we must do, he never promised the rain would not come. It will. He never promised us that if you do what I ask you to do, if you do what I tell you to do, then you're going to be protected from the flood. No, he never said that. He said you will get it. But when it comes, you'll be secure. Emergency officials in Puerto Rico say the island has been destroyed. The storm knocking out power everywhere. Hurricane Maria laying waste to this once tropical paradise. Roads now deserted. Signs that life here has come to a complete standstill. Hey, I'm Brad Charles with Cuba Foundation. Uh, we're here in a community, uh, it's called La Hormiga, which means the ant. La Hormiga is a small community located in northern Puerto Rico. It's a humble place where there is great need. I'm here with uh, a bunch of friends of mine from a church, uh, Watkinsville First Baptist. My name is Vic Doss. I am the college pastor at Watkinsville First Baptist, and I am here with 15 college students uh, serving alongside the Cubit Foundation in a community called La Hormiga. Uh, we're just here to love and serve uh, the people of Puerto Rico. This community got hit pretty hard. Um, these, most of these people in this community um, are squatters. And so when FEMA, the organization FEMA comes through, if you have a title of your land, um, they will help you more. If you don't have a title of land, if you're a squatter, then you don't get much help. Eager to get started, Cubit and the team prepare to do whatever they can to repair some of the damage. And with help from locals as well, all the right people came together to make this project happen. how you help. Trust me, it all adds up. Cubit uses trips like these in order to be able to service those that are in deepest need, helping them both physically and spiritually. My favorite thing that we've done so far is walk around in the neighborhood to do surveys just to meet the people and hear their stories and assess the damage and see what needs to be done by later teams and just talking with these people and asking them if they needed prayer, if they wanted us to pray with our team when we got back to the house. They got emotional almost every single time and it was so cool to see that they just wanted someone to listen, to show that they cared, to show that we were praying for them um, and for them to just feel that 
God loves them and for them to see that in a unique way was the biggest blessing for me and I think for a lot of people on the team. All the support behind the Cubit Foundation is what makes this possible. Allowing them to restore hope not only to people of Puerto Rico, but across the globe. So from a real young age, um, I've always had a kind of burden to help uh, real poor folks, people that are down on their luck, just and they have nowhere else to turn. And so this is why I do what I do. Um, God put something in me, um, especially in the Hispanic culture. But um, I mean, we we help, I help people all over the world, but um, it is our job um, to help others, to help widows, to help orphans, um, help guys like this guy that he's lost his hands and feet um, that can't do anything. Um, so I would encourage every person out there to use the gifts that God has given you. It doesn't matter what you got. Everybody has gifts. Everybody's good at something. Um, please use it. Um, God's given you all kinds of talents. So I appreciate it. I wanted to thank everybody that gives so much to the Cupid Foundation that supports me, supports my, my mom and dad. Um, it means a ton. It means a ton to everybody we help um, all over the world. Um, we could not do it without you. Um, Dios te bendiga. Hi, I'm Dr. Ron Charles of the Cubit Foundation. You know, we've been in Middle East for going on 30 years. And I would love to come to your church or your meeting to let you know what's happening uh, in reality in the Middle East. And uh, we'd love to come there and let you know what's happening, what the Lord's doing in that part of the world. So if you can contact us at the thecubitfoundation.org that we could come to your place. And if you would like to find out more about us, then go to www.cubitfoundation.org. Thank you.